Jesse, are you ready for rapid fire? Let's do it. That was a quick we in, we out. I can't believe we're already into rapid fire. I know. Fill in the blank. Sam Hartman getting drafted by the United Football League's Birmingham Stallions is blank. Is a great backup plan. I mean, that like if you're Sam Hartman, you didn't have to do any work and you just got drafted by another team, right? So obviously the goal is, you know, he signed with the commanders after after being an undrafted free agent. The commanders, I mean, they were at Notre Dame's Pro Day. Cliff, Cliff Kingsbury seems to like Sam Hartman. It seems like they want him to work into, you know, a solid backup role. But to me, it's always nice to have a solid backup plan to fall back to especially one that you didn't have to do anything for, right? Because if this thing doesn't pan out with the commanders, basically the Stallions have his right if he wants to continue to play, you know, football in the in the UFL. So I think it's great for Sam Hartman um, overall, but obviously the goal is to stay with the commanders, right? Like that's what you're working towards. This is still a good fallback plan. No, and I mean, it, it's a potential, like you said, fallback plan is the key. And Birmingham is actually, they've won the last two, uh, championships. They're the defending UFL champion. They only lost one game last year. Their quarterback this year was Adrian Martinez, the former Kansas that State Nebraska? and Nebraska quarterback. Yeah, there yeah. it is. He threw for 15 touchdowns, completed 59% of his passes. They have Matt Corral, I guess, on the roster as well, the former Ole, Ole Miss. Guy. So who knows what will happen with Sam Hartman. What makes things interesting – with Washington, a couple things. One, Cliff Kingsbury was at Notre Dame's Pro Day, and at the end of Pro Day, he was chatting up Sam Hartman for quite some time, and then they signed Sam Hartman right after the draft and gave him a really sizable uh, guaranteed They contract. want him there. Right. Over $250,000 they gave him guaranteed, which was the highest end of all the undrafted free agents to sign. So the likelihood is Sam Hartman's not going anywhere. He's probably going to end up at least on, on the practice squad with Washington. Now, part I mean, of that, isn't that such a good feeling though, that Cliff Kingsbury sought you out a guy that they knew that they probably weren't even going to draft, but they wanted right. to make sure that you're on their roster. And like, we're talking about, you know, I know Cliff Kingsbury has had his up and downs, you know, in the NFL ranks, but we're still talking about one of the better QB minds quarter, you know, coaches, developers in the game and so if i'm yeah. sam hartman and this guy's taking time out of his day to come see me talk to me make sure that you know i'm i feel comfortable i'm rewarded you know like you talked about with like the signing bonus and all that stuff like again it's it's a great situation to be in and if all that fails the ufl is a nice solid fallback but, see, but i don't think it's going to come to that i think they truly want to develop him on their roster for as long as they can keep him but this is also why I think that, especially for the longevity of the UFL, I think that it can be beneficial to both the UFL and the NFL if these UFL teams have developmental deals with NFL teams. Like so, a two-way deal like the NBA, basically? Well, not necessarily. But, you know, they play in the spring, whereas the NFL is obviously playing. In, right. Their, their training camp it's runs like off-season everything. development. Right. So, like, if you've got a third-string quarterback who was on your practice squad, for example, or maybe he was an emergency quarterback when somebody got hurt and he got bumped up on the depth chart a little bit, but he's not getting any so real snaps, you send – well, Ian Book, maybe it ends up being Sam Hartman. Any of these kind of guys, you send them – They're you know, they're, they're still with whatever their NFL team is, but they play and get actual game reps in the UFL to give everybody more evaluation. Yeah. Of these guys. I think it would be basically, you know, like a minor league type situation. I think it would be great for everybody if you had that kind of developmental arrangement with the UFL. So Notre Dame is doing its New York media blitz today and tomorrow. Marcus Freeman and a few players are uh, out there talking on various ESPN platforms. Marcus Freeman was on a couple of different ESPN shows this afternoon. Riley Leonard was on one as well. Here's the list of the players that Freeman took with him out east. Jordan Clark, Riley Leonard, Bo Collins, Howard Cross, Riley Mills, Mitchell Evans, Xavier Watts, Benjamin Morrison, and Steve Angeli. So first, what do you think of that list? 
that list is like majority of it makes sense, but there's a couple where I'm just like scratching my head a little bit. And I think the the overall vibe that I'm getting is that Marcus Freeman wanted Give it to, to me. <laughs> Marcus Freeman wanted to get guy he he picked guys based on to me it seems like what's I, I can't like class like he, he went with a lot of older guys essentially sure. guys sure. a lot of experience um but I'm just gonna say point blank like I don't think I don't think that Stephen Jelly should have went um I don't think Bo Collins should have went and I don't think Jordan Clark should have went Jordan Clark is an interesting one because his dad, obviously. Ryan Clark. Ryan Clark works for ESPN. Works for ESPN. So, like, how much that and Marcus Freeman, you'll actually hear it here in, in a minute. He said on one of the shows today that he had just gotten done talking to Ryan Clark before he went on ESPN. The Angeli thing. This is the most curious. It's like one. why you're inviting people to to ask you why are you bringing to, two quarterbacks? You're taking the backup quarterback, and that with all these questions about is CJ Carr going to end up being the backup and yada yada yada. The answer is no, because they're not taking Steve Angeli <laughs> yeah, out that's there. That's what I mean. They're not taking Steve Angeli out there if they don't think that he. Is that guy? Well, I think that's the fun part about these lists is it gives you early insight or indication about how the coaching staff feels about certain players. Yep. They clearly trust Ryan Clark. They or sorry, Jordan, Jordan Clark. Clark. They clearly trust Steve Angeli, even though he's you know going to be the backup behind Riley Leonard. And they trust Bo Collins, even though he's never played a snap at Notre Dame. So it's you know, it's never like, even officially practiced at Notre right. Dame. Right. And so, like it, uh, to me, it shows again how they feel about certain players essentially or, or their confidence in certain players. But again, I, I can live, I can live with Bo Collins, but Jordan Clark and Steve Angeli are not on my list to New yeah. York. As Salty says, he thinks that they, he took people who will be going into the draft this year. That ain't Steve Angeli. <laughs> that's, that's not why he took Steve Angeli. It's like another, there's a little boost of confidence. You know, like, here's your compliment sandwich, Steve Angeli. We're taking you to New York with the crew of all these different veterans. We think a lot of you. That's what it seems like. You know, a lot of people are talking about it's, it's good good business to help out your backup quarterback that might end up transferring. I, to me, it's, it's just not worth it. You, it's not worth it to bring him on a national stage and open up the conversations. Well, is Ryan Leonard really going to be healthy this season? Well, is Steve Angeli really closer to Riley Leonard on the depth chart than what we're giving him credit for? Like, you're just asking, especially at a national level, ESPN, New York, like you're asking for, for, for people to start asking you questions, essentially. Seems odd. Seems odd. DK says just It's never class, done before. I guarantee no other yeah. team is taking two quarterbacks with them. No, no. You don't like, you know, none of these, none of these teams at SEC Media Days sent the backup quarterback <laughs> to go to media days to answer questions there. You send your starting quarterback. I think I saw something like 12 quarterbacks or something like that from different teams went to sec media days. I'm honestly surprised that it's not more, but maybe those other teams have quarterback battles going on in fall camp or whatever. That's the but, word I was looking for upperclassmen. It felt upperclassmen dominant heavy. Yeah. And I guess Angeli falls into that category since he's going to be a junior. You know, I think he's an upperclassman. I think Marcus Freeman respects him as a guy who works hard, a leader on the team. Maybe if he's not a you know a full time starter, all of those things. But again, I'm just not sacrificing the optics of that by bringing both of my quarterbacks. I'm just not. Yep, I agree. I think it was a very interesting choice. It's a choice for sure. I don't mind Jordan Clark as much because again, like the guy. You know, he is Ryan Clark's son, but he's also got, like, we got to talk to him during the spring. Big personality, very well-spoken, all those different kind of things. Bo Collins kind of seems to fall into that as well. And even though neither one of those guys have been with this team before, well, I mean, you know, neither had had uh, Riley Leonard. And he went out there, and Sam Hartman went out there last year. But, it, I mean, it's a long list of guys who they took out there. So who on this list do you think is is ultimately going to be named a captain? 
Because we got a lot of veterans out there, and not all of them are going to be captains. Um, Riley Leonard will be a captain. Has this is going to this is mm, Riley? It's going to be between Riley Mills and Howard Cross. See, I that's what gonna, I mean. I think they're both really viable. I know, but I think you're only going to pick one of them. Yeah, because they're both defensive linemen. Right. I think they're going to go with Riley Mills because of. He he's been at Notre Dame from start to finish. H- Howard Cross transferred in. If I'm not wrong, no, no, you're wrong. No, about that. no. I'm wrong about that. Okay, I think you're thinking R.J. Oben. Throw that out the window. I'm going Howard Cross. <laughs> R.J. Oben and Howard Cross's dads played together with the Giants. Maybe that's the connection you were. Maybe, making. maybe. I'm going to go Riley Leonard, Howard Cross, um, Xavier Watts, and Mitchell Evans, but. What's tough about Mitchell Evans is I think he's ultimately going to represent a young offensive line, and I think you usually have an offensive lineman on there, but I think that's going to be Mitchell Evans this season. So those are my, so you're my saying four off the list. Instead of an offensive lineman, you're going to have the tight end. Yes. Maybe. Okay. Because there's just so much inexperience that's on That's true, because none of the line. offensive linemen, I don't think any of the offensive linemen are going to be named captains. I think the captains are, are going to come from this group. I mean, that's why you take – you know, this, you know, these guys to a place like that. So I agree. I think that, that Leonard will be one. I mean, it's almost flip a coin between cross and mill. That's the toughest one to me. I know one of those guys will, you said Mills, So I'll say cross just to be different. Evans makes sense. Watts makes sense. Did I already say Leonard? Yes. I mean, I think Morrison, Makes a lot of sense, really. Well, I just don't think you're well. going to have more than one. I think you have like a secondary player, a defensive line player, a linebacker player, and then same thing on offense. You have like an offensive lineman, a quarterback, and then like a skill position guy. I just don't think that you're going to have Watts and Benjamin Morrison. And so even though I think Watts coming off that big season, player of the year, you know, that sort of stuff, even though Morrison is more talented, I still think Watts is going to get it just out of, you know, being more of an upperclassman experience, yada, yada, yada. Yeah. USMA 87 says Kaiser. I mean, he. I think he's another. He's going to be the linebacker candidate. captain for sure. Yeah. But he didn't. I nailed him last year. Do you remember that? I do remember that. By the way, you know what's coming up next week? Speaking of things that you nailed. Are we doing our breakouts again? Breakout, breakout predictions. <laughs> breakout predictions next week. <laughs> Okay, so ESPN has Riley Leonard as Notre Dame's X factor for the season. Here's what they say. What exactly do the Irish have in Leonard? Over two seasons at Duke, Leonard looked like a potential first-round NFL pick at times, but an injury ended his 23 season early, kept him out of spring ball in South Bend. Leonard's overall numbers from 23 don't exactly scream superstardom. 57% completions. 6.7 6.7 yards per throw, three touchdown passes, three picks. Obviously, his upside far exceeds those <laughs> numbers, but the Irish have invested a lot in luring him from Duke, and it's fair to wonder whether even a repeat of fellow ACC transfer Sam Hartman's performance from 23 would be enough to lift Notre Dame's offense to something approaching playoff caliber. So that is from ESPN on Riley Leonard. Are you buying or selling that? Yes. Yeah, I, I'm buying full on, full blown. Riley Leonard is the entire X factor on this offense. If they want to go to the next level, if they want to win games in the playoff and make a, um, you know, make a run at the national championship, that has to be on the back of Riley Leonard's performance. I mean, that's just point blank. Look at all the good teams uh, over the years in the playoffs and national. Like they have good quarterback play, right? Like that's that's what it comes down to. I guess the part that I'm not really selling is they invested a lot to lure him from Duke. It's not like they gave, you know, they had to give up. It's not like the NFL where you had to give up players or like a trade or anything like that. Like he made the decision as a grad transfer to come over to Notre Dame. So I don't know what, I guess I'm curious about what, you know, what they've invested in him to lure him from Duke. Um, And I think that the last part, it's fair to wonder whether even a a repeat, a fellow ACC transfer, Sam Hartman's performance from 2023 would be enough to lift Notre Dame's offense to something approaching playoff caliber. I mean, I, I'm going to say last year, Sam Hartman's performance in the big games is really what held them back ultimately, right? And 
And I think that was in combination with, with stuff that Jared Parker was doing an offensive coordinator. Um, but I, I think if, I, I, I don't think he's going to repeat what Sam Hartman did. I think he's going to be better than what Sam Hartman did um, last season. And that's ultimately what's going to drive Notre Dame to be more successful this season. So I, I'm, I'm buying most of what it, what was said. Um, but those last couple of things I'd be a little bit sell on. See, I'm selling a lot of it. And where I start with is the questioning of the numbers that he had last year. This this part right here. Leonard's overall numbers from 2023 don't exactly scream superstardom. 57.6% per, percent completions, 6.7 yards of throw, three touchdown passes, three picks. Well, guess what? He was healthy until he played Notre Dame. And in the four games before he played Notre Dame, he completed 76% of his passes and he ran for over eight yards per attempt in the four games before the injury. It was really, you know, like, now, did he have a game where he didn't hit 60%? Yeah, it was Clemson. But guess what he did? He, he ran led, all over him. He ran all over him and he led Duke to a win over Clemson. When was the last time Duke beat Clemson before last year? Go I don't care about look. stats. Just it give took me a wins. long time. And, and, that's, and that's my point. I don't think it's fair to judge Riley Leonard on those stats because almost half of the games that he played in were played with an injury. You know, like he tried to come back, and that's when those numbers went down. Was because Obviously, he wasn't able to run as much, and he didn't throw nearly as accurately after the injury that he suffered to that angle, you know, to the to the ankle. Now, the other part, that I would say is, you know, like it's fair to wonder whether even a repeat of fellow ACC transfer Sam Hartman's performance would be enough to lift Notre Dame's offense to something approaching playoff caliber. You know, again, you're going to have a completely different offensive coordinator in here running the show. And now do we largely expect different wide receiver room? Yeah, yeah, largely different wide receiver room. The whole thing. So I, I think it's an apples to oranges comparison. If you're even going to try to compare, you know, Sam Hartman's last year to Riley Leonard this year, just on the fact that you're going to have a completely different system, completely different personnel. And then you throw in the fact that they're two different kinds of quarterbacks because Riley Leonard is a guy who, if, if, you know, all systems are firing well, he's going to, he's going to run for at least 700 yards this season you know, on top of what he's going to do throwing the football. So that's that's where I've got to be out. You know, like, is it fair, you know, to wonder? Okay, yeah, but you're, you're you know, you're a lot of this argument is based on a quarterback who was injured last season. Now, is it fair to wonder whether or not he can come back th from the injury? Of course, because we're all wondering that. That's, you know, basically our biggest concern. But is it, you know, are, are all these other things, like the, most of the comparisons – to me, are too much apples to oranges to try to apply that to Riley Leonard because of all the different other factors that you have around it. Yeah, and I think you did a better job of articulating kind of my uneasiness with that last sentence about, and it's fair to wonder whether even a repeat of fellow ACC transfer, you know, Sam Hartman's performance would be enough to lift Notre Dame. It's just, I think that they're being, I think the expectations are ultimately different from, you know, everything that transpired after Sam Hartman got here and, and you know, the situation, the offensive coordinator and, and those sort of things, I think they kind of had to find maybe like a realistic grounds of what they wanted to accomplish, you know, as an offense, considering everything that was kind of going on around them, you know, what their identity was going to be and knowing that they had Audric Estime, you know, lining up behind them. I think that played a large role in it. But Riley Leonard is going to take on more of that Audric SMA role this season because of his ability to run the ball, right? And so you combine that with a completely different offensive coordinator, um, probably a different scheme that's going to involve, you know, far more RPO type reads. It's just, it's it's like you said, it's an apples to oranges comparison. But I still do think at the end of the day, Riley Leonard's performance in the big games is ultimately what's going to be the X factor for Notre Dame oh, for making sure. a serious run this season. For sure. I mean, that's... You know, again, like if you boil everything down to why Riley Leonard is here, that's it because they had to get better. In yeah, the, they had to the get game. better in the Ohio State game. They had to get yep. better, you know, in the Louisville game when things aren't going right or maybe not, you know, to script or game plan. That's where Riley Leonard comes in because you can't game plan for Riley Leonard's feet. You can't game plan 
for all the wrinkles that can come off of Riley Leonard. With Sam Hartman, you shut down his arm. You've shut down a majority of what he can do with the football. Yep, exactly. A uh, good point that a, a couple people made about Steve Angeli that I wasn't thinking about. Now, he is from New Jersey. So, you know, like you go back and you're you're in that, you know, New York, New Jersey. Okay. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm looking to see. I know that there are at least a couple other players on the roster who are from New York and New Jersey. Are they taking Rhino Mont- Monteforti, the uh, the long snapper? <laughs> now you're just being ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Howard Cross is as well. You know, Howard Cross. Just simply put, Jersey just guy. simply say there's no excuse for why you should bring a second quarterback with you. Right. I still. Yeah. Like, how yeah, does I mean, Riley it's, Leonard feel about that? It's not a that. high school media day. Yeah, right? exactly. Like, oh, he's from New Jersey, so let's take him back. So I can't, I can't go in on that. <laughs> okay, so Marcus Freeman spent a little time today on uh, on ESPN. First, he was on Sports Center this afternoon. Then he went on College Football Live a little bit later. And Hannah Storm, who is a Notre Dame alum was uh, the one who did the interview on SportsCenter. It covered some topics like Riley Leonard and you know the expanded playoff and all these different things. Then at the end, they did something called the two-minute drill because, as she said, college football is going to have the two-minute warning this year. So they put Marcus Freeman through the two-minute drill, kind of throwing you know some, some topics at him. So I'll let you take a listen right now to how that two minute drill went else new in college football this year is the two minute warning so we want to do a two minute drill with you okay 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 uh <laughs> here we go let's start the clock okay this is big on tiktok right now how many unread text messages do you have one wow <laughs> from who i'm big i'm big on it's something that's it's a text i have to reply to and i didn't have a chance to so i kept it on unread but <laughs> yeah. i'm big on okay. listen I, I i don't want my text message to fill up i want to uh, answer them right okay, away okay who's the most famous person on your contact list oh man who's the most famous just person? one quick oh uh, ryan clark i just i just was with him I, okay I, okay <laughs> ryan clark that's a good one okay his son jordan plays for you give me three words to describe his son uh smart aggressive uh playmaker all right, just like dear old dad. Uh, you were recently on a podcast. You said back in college, Cam Hayward chest bumped you, and it was very painful. Did you actually lose teeth, and how many? I lost two teeth, my front teeth. Oh, my God. Okay. Uh, the leprechaun mascot does push-ups after every touchdown. How many push-ups can you do? Uh, 70. 70? Good Lord. I'm going to say that right now. Okay, that's, you, that's really... That's you didn't really, say full extension, that's you know. Really full extension. Okay. Um, there is a new edition of EA Sports College Football. What overall rating would you have given yourself as a college football player? Not great. I'm, I'm eight, high 80s, maybe. Um, maybe mid 80s. I wasn't a great football player. Okay, you know, I, <laughs> By the way, you were rated a 96. Um, yeah. What rating would you give your team? Um, really high. Uh, you know, <laughs> now they got to live up to that expectation. But if that rating is based on potential, it's going to be high. Now we got to go and do it. Okay. A familiar place, face is uh, returning to do play-by-play for your games this season. How do you feel about Dan Hicks calling games this season? I tell you what, he is uh, a, a, an ultimate professional. But the thing I respect about him most is that he has a great wife. And uh, <laughs> he's going gonna to make this program better. <laughs> <laughs> Which famous female alum would you like to have on the sideline this year? Last question. The one I'm talking to. Yay! Bing, bing, bing. Perfect. (laughs) Marcus, you're the best. I sincerely, and you know from my heart, wish you all of the best this season. And may the look of the Irish be with you. Thanks, Marcus. Thanks, Hannah. This was a blast. (laughs) Hannah Storm, of course, a Notre Dame alumna herself. And that's, you know, kind of, and her husband, who she mentioned, Dan Hicks, is going to be the play-by-play guy on NBC TV this season. I didn't realize that the unread text is another one of these TikTok things that's going around now, Jess. How many unread text messages do you have? Right now? Yes. Uh, Let me tell you. Probably because we're doing a show, I have 14 unread text messages. 14? Man. 
Before the show, I had one unread text message. But I'm like Marcus Freeman. I don't open a message unless I intend to respond because I will open it. And if I don't respond, I'll forget about it. But when I mark it as unread or if I don't open it, then I always have that reminder. I need to respond. Yeah. Sloppy Joe. Yes, Dan Hicks is married to Hannah Storm. That's kind of why she threw that in there on him. Jordan Clark, smart, aggressive playmaker. I, I like those adjectives. I'll take him. I had never heard that about his teeth and the chest. Bump you wouldn't know. They were man. I didn't realize those were fake teeth. No that's wonder he's got a, such good looking teeth. That's such a dumb <laughs> college football moment. You know what I, I mean? Just chest bumping. He probably got a helmet right to his front teeth. Like blood oh, was man. gushing out everywhere. Like that had to be not fun. Man. The 70 push-ups. Like, God, he's just, how many I knew he was could, fit. But. How many do you think you could do right? How many could you do in your prime? How many do you think you could do right now? So this is funny because I my freshman year of high school – there was, I had an English teacher and he always, he worked out. He was a fit guy for how oh, old I he was, this guy. I remember this but guy. he would always challenge football players to push up contests in the middle of the classroom. In my heyday, I could get up between about 50 and 60, I believe. Was, and I'm that's full extension. Marcus Freeman said not full extension. I could get over 50 full extension. And then there was another guy that I played baseball with Sam Hosinski in high school. Him and I would always duke out push-up battles at practice and stuff like that. And so that again, we could get over 50, but that was, I was a while ago right now. I think I would put myself, I could clear 20, 30 would probably be pushing it. Yeah. In my prime, when I used to have to do like army PT tests, cause we got timed how many, Sit-ups and push-ups can you do each in two minutes? I could get 100 push-ups in two minutes. And that was, you know, they had to be full extension. You had to touch the fist, right? And you had someone put the fist on the ground, and you had to touch the fist every time. So I could get 100 in two minutes back in the day. I could probably, I'm going to go 35-40 right now. Like, like not in two minutes, but like consecutive, Yeah, you know, with minimal breaks before, you know, I feel like falling over. (laughs) <laughs> so <laughs> 70 would be legit 70 would be legit he might even be well it's not it's not only 70. a strength thing it's a stamina thing yeah and that's the thing about push-ups because like they're they're even so different than you know like bench press and stuff like that because you're absolutely right it's a different different kind of stamina really like a almost a different kind of muscle that you're uh that you're pushing there all right so Good stuff, and again, we've we've uh, we've got some of the stuff up, or we should have some of the stuff up from uh, Marcus Freeman's Sports Center and College Football Live appearances on uh, on IrishBreakdown.com here in a little bit. All right, I've got some more audio. This is Chris Mad Dog Russo and Paul Feinbaum. Oh my gosh, having a crazy little exchange on ESPN this week about whether or not Lincoln Riley has been a success in his two years at USC. So. Russo says Riley has been successful since Caleb Williams won the Heisman two years ago. Here's the clip. Chris Mad Dog Russo and Paul Feinbaum going at it. They go for a good program. They were terrible. USC was, what was their record before he got there the year before? Did he lose five games? But, four games? But, but Doggy in the transfer, I mean, he brought a bunch of players. He brought the best player in the country. With I won a Heisman he Trophy with him. not get much out of him. And he won a Heisman Trophy. At a place where they win Heisman won. with Marcus what Allen and what Charles did he win? White what did it? What, and how many, Simpson. How many trophies did he, how many, how many Carson Palmer. trophies did he hold up? Well, hold on now. You're talking about Heisman Trophy in USC. That means everything. Carson Palmer, Leonard, Reggie Bush, Simpson. That's a, They love Heisman Trophies. And he brought a Heisman Trophy there. That counts. That counts. I mean, you... You're, These, you're using, they love okay, Heisman Trophies in USC. reason why, why USC is good? Come on. It's, gonna, it's the USC. Assembly. They've been around since 1910. New Rodney. USC. That's why. It's a much better program than Oklahoma. I'm surprised at you. <laughs> Don't talk about Vanderbilt <laughs> football. Oh, uh, Tommy wants to know why he's yelling. He's yelling because that's he's mad, mad dog, dog Russo. Russo. That's, that's There's that's, a reason why him and Stephen A. do a show together because they just yell right. at each other. That's right. So first, what do you think of that little exchange that Russo and Feinbaum <laughs> had there? 
Um, I I enjoyed it as a consumer. I don't <laughs> like when they just start yelling at each other. I know that's the that's it's the, it's that's the typical the argument. Russo ultimate ultimately. That's right? right. People in arguments think if they start talking louder and and screaming things that that ultimately is what's going to make them right. Right. I, that's my least favorite type of sports discussion. So like when he started that, yelling, that is the stereotypical like why people don't like those kind of shows. <laughs> you know because. Because I could, because like think about Stephen A. Smith and Russo going at it like that. But go ahead. Going back to you know what the topic at hand. Hold on, hold on, hold off on that because I wanted to. I just the one thing that I will say, even though you know, like you said, Russo going overboard, you know, going at Feinbaum, yelling at him. I mean, it's it's classic, Chris Russo, but. How many times does Feinbaum have somebody push back on it? That's and that's what you got to respect is he's always the right. guy that's like feels like he's his word is the gospel type of situation. Exactly, exactly. And so I did think it was at least very you know I, I thought it was I thought it was pretty funny just to see like Paul Feinbaum's face and have <laughs> yeah. somebody coming at him. Like that, like a mad felt, dog. I think basically. he was a little scared, you know. Like he, I know. he looked like a scared dog when when Russo started getting loud with him. It's like for one of the few times he didn't know what to say, but at the same time, uh, you know, like when you, well, let me just let me just put it this way. Here was my favorite part. Hey, they love okay, Isaac told me the USC. Why, why USC is good? Come on, it's, gonna, it's the USC. Seven. They've been around since 1910. New Rodney, USC. That's why it's a much better program than Oklahoma. I'm surprised at you. Newt Rockney. <laughs> now Newt Rockney was at USC, I guess, according to Russo, who, by the way, had a daughter who went to Notre Dame just a few years ago. He had a daughter going to Notre Dame, and now he's putting Newt Rockney at USC. So I, that was obviously that, and that's the other thing about Mad Dog is he just starts throwing out names at exactly. some point. In most of his arguments, he just starts <laughs> shooting from the hip, baby. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> so the other half of this is the actual topic that they were debating. Are you are, are you buying or selling what Russo is saying? Like, do you think that? that Lincoln Riley has been a success at USC. Um, I'm buying it because they did win a Heisman and they've had double digit win or he had double digit wins in his first season. And before, before that they hadn't had double digit wins since the 2017 season. And for USC, I think the standards are there that if you're not double digits, you should at least be pushing or knocking on the door of double digits. And after 2017, they went five and seven, eight and five, uh, five and one in the COVID year, and then four and eight in Clay Hilton's last year. So I, I do believe he has been a success, but I don't believe the rationale of, well, Caleb Williams won a Heisman, and that's the only reason why they've been successful. I think there's more to it than that. And I think if that's the basis of your argument, I think you should have got more out of your team since you did have Caleb Williams, the best quarterback in college football. I agree with that. They did win the Pac-12 in Riley's first year and they did go to the cotton bowl they did win 11 games and i mean look if you're a notre dame fan and you're judging this and if you think that marcus freeman has been successful in his first two years you have to think that lincoln riley has been successful in his first two years because they've got the exact same record they're both 19 and 8 through their first two years at their schools now they've gone about it a different way and like to your your last point there jesse about did they get enough out of Caleb Williams? He obviously did win the Heisman Trophy in his first season. His second season got vastly uh, overshadowed, though, with the fact that they averaged almost 42 points per game. Their USC's offense did. They ranked third in the nation in scoring, but the defense was 118th, giving up over 34 points a game. I mean, that's ultimately what Riley Leonard, or not, not Riley Leonard, Lincoln Riley has to get fixed is that defense. And that's why he hired a new defensive coordinator. Sorry. Someone was knocking on the door and my house went absolutely nuts. Yes, so, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
but I, I agree with a lot, a lot of what you're saying. You know, Lincoln Riley can't control – he's an offensive guy, and he can't control, for lack of better terms, that his defense was poop, you know, the last two seasons, right? If they even have a halfway mediocre defense, I think they're a lot better. And you can make the argument, you know, if Caleb Williams stays healthy in that first year, you know, things might have been a little bit different in those Utah games. So, you know, I, I think there's some things factoring into it. But with the short sample that we've had, you know, 11-win season – um, an Heisman winner, um, you know, last season obviously was a little bit of a letdown with the eight and five season. But again, I, I think with like Marcus Freeman, you know, this is year three for Lincoln Riley. Caleb Williams is gone now. You don't have the great, you know, the, the best quarterback in the portal, the Heisman quarterback coming with you. I truly believe, you know, we talk about all of the, you know, this being a year of kind of judgment for Marcus Freeman. I, I think that holds true for Lincoln Riley. It's that covenant three, you know, third year. This is kind of officially your type of players that you're recruiting, bringing in through the transfer portal. Um, and again, you don't have Kayla Williams to fall back on anymore. So I think this is going to be a true test of where Lincoln Riley is as a head coach with USC. Yeah. Okay. So clarification, DK is correct. Utah won in the Pac-12 championship game. USC won the regular season. Yes. Pac-12. That's, I guess, kind of what I was referring to sometimes i don't think about the conference championship game since we cover a team that never has to play in a conference championship <laughs> game but it's again point point made and and completely right on that and as andrew says he was one of he was a conference championship game away from making the yeah. playoff in his and again game. like you can and they only lost by four points in that game so and, and caleb williams hamstring wasn't a hundred percent yeah, that's right. He was injured in that game. That's absolutely right. So I think he's been successful, you know, a complete success. No, because they did fall back and the defense was putrid last year. And, you know, I, you know DK. I think I Feinbaum was, was rating him good. off of this past season and not really taking in both seasons. So I, in terms of this argument, I lean more towards Russo. But again, it's not strictly because Caleb Williams won a Heisman. I think there's other things that factor into that argument. Yeah. I think Feinbaum can uh, fall to recency bias quite a bit in some of his arguments, like for as rational as he sort of makes himself out to be. I think mm -hmm. he can fall into that trap sometimes of, of just straight out recency bias. So. Fill in the blank. Caitlin Clark setting the WNBA single game record with 19 assists and also scoring or assisting on 66 total points, which is also another new record. And the Fevers lost to Dallas last night is blank. It's epic. I mean, like, the, again, we're Caitlin Clark is continuing to do stuff or, or, you know, set records or redefine kind of these milestones. And she's only, you know, in her first season into the WNBA. So I, I think it's completely epic. And I think it's kind of funny that it, it felt kind of intentional to me. You know what I mean? It, it felt like she kind of had a point to prove. We're on national TV going into the all-star break. A lot of eyes. And, and then it, it's it kind of just shows, you know, my game isn't all about scoring. I can dish that thing out. I can get other others involved. Or I can put up 15 shots a game. You just let me know, and well, I'll do what's ever best for the team. So I think it's epic because of people continue to doubt Caitlin Clark, but I think she continues to kind of come back or clap back at everyone and, and give them something else new that they hadn't that they didn't know was a part of her arsenal, essentially. Yeah. I mean, obviously, she was just a political football, you know, when she came into the league, just with all the conversation going around and you know like virtually none of the conversation was actually about how she played it was about all these other things and everyone had an agenda and everyone's trying to make a point and all this different stuff now it has died down and it's actually got to the point where she's just playing basketball and guess what she's playing really really well it's like her or angel reese are going to be the rookie of the year but she she is the fastest WNBA player since Sue Bird to get to over 400 points and 200 assists in the same season since Sue Bird. And I think it was 2003. So it's been over two decades and the second fastest player ever behind Tisha Pinichero, who was, I think, one of the original WNBA players or, you know, like in the first few years 
of the league. So, you know, it's back to she's in rarefied air. And oh, by the way, it's actually because she played basketball, even though that's getting a lot less conversation these days. But they're 11 and 15. They're the third best team in the East. They're two wins away from matching their win total from a season ago. Her rookie of the year uh, odds went from minus 1,000 to minus 2,000 overnight. So it's just, you know, I don't know. You know, they've basically played the toughest schedule in the league. and It's basically been for TV purposes. So it's pretty great to kind of, you know, 19 assists. There's nothing to sneeze at at all. Rike Gumbawale, 24 points last night, by the way, in the Dallas win. So that was nice, too, And as those two uh, non-Olympians are going to face off against the Olympians <laughs> in the All-Star game this weekend. Tommy saying... She's scared to do the three-point contest. Well, remember, she did that three-point contest with, wasn't it, with Steph Curry back in the men's All-Star break? Mm, I think, I want to say that was, was that her? Oh, that wasn't her. That was Sabrina. Was Sabrina? That was, yeah. That's what mind. I thought it was. That's right, because she would have still been in college at that point. Never mind. Never mind. <laughs> I digress. Yes. I forgot when we were still on fine bomb, I had something else to add. That was really funny. Go ahead. Throw it in there. So <laughs> I saw this clip today on X and it was, it was from the sec media day throughout this week and Lane Kiffin. Uh, save, them, it, save it. I've got that. <laughs> you got that up tomorrow. That's coming tomorrow. <laughs> yes. He snuck in that jab. <laughs> yes. There was only so much we could fit into today with all this okay. other Marcus Freeman stuff going okay. on that'll be we've got that queued up for tomorrow's show i'm glad you saw that 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 was really funny to me i saw it literally right before the show was getting ready to start i'm like <laughs> i don't have time to get this ready at this point so yes we will do that for sure so that'll be fun as well all right well that's gonna do it appreciate all your questions from the we in we out portion of the show earlier tonight good stuff as always and we will wrap up the show or wrap up the week tomorrow uh, the Friday shows are winding down, by the way, because once training camp starts, the Friday shows go away because we're we're now getting ready for the season and we'll have pregame shows and all that kind of stuff once the season gets going. So your uh, your Friday shows, I think we've only got basically two more to go this week. Maybe next week. Yeah, this weekend, next week. There won't be the week after that because camp will be underway at that point. All right. We will wrap it up with that. Again, please hit the like button before you leave and help out the uh, the channel, the show, and all that good stuff. Don't forget, if you missed it, we've got all kinds of Notre Dame women's basketball interviews that we've done this summer. The latest was Leah Two King. Had her the other day. Olivia Miles, Hannah Hidalgo, Liza Carlin, the other grand transfer. You can find them either on the YouTube channel or on the uh, the podcast platforms that you listen on as well and i've got a football guest coming up next week by the way so we got that to look forward to football guest coming up on next week's show hit the like button and we will talk to you manana on ib nation sports talk